Hi there, welcome back to the new video. So today I'll be going through this report that I got on archive while I was searching around data augmentation in NLP. So this is titled as text data augmentation made simple by leveraging NLP cloud APIs. So data augmentation is a very common technique in vision domain and people have started to pick it up in the NLP domain as well. So what it means is, let's say you have a data X comma Y where X is a sentence and Y is its corresponding label. So you can imagine it to be like X is a movie review and Y is the sentiment associated to that review. So as a part of data augmentation, we transform this X and create a X bar out of it while still preserving the label Y. So as you could see, since Y is still preserved, which means the transformation that we want to apply, let's call it T, has to be semantically invariant, which means it doesn't change the meaning of original sentence. So X bar, could be syntactically little different compared to X, but semantically, it should mean the same thing because of the hard condition that we have put on the Y. So this is the entire idea of data augmentation in a nutshell. Now, whole of this report and what people have been researching is to come up with different techniques to how do you define this T efficiently so that X dash is diverse enough yet semantic coherent so that model becomes robust and generalizes well on the unseen data. Okay, so let's move forward. So the author has mentioned that all the text augmentation techniques studied with an amplification factor of only five increase the accuracy of result in the range of 4.3 to 21.6. Okay, so all of the techniques that author has mentioned kind of gives on an average accuracy boost from 4.3 percentage to 21 percentage. So this is a huge boost actually. So author has tested all of this on a text polarity, which is on the sentiment analysis task, which means given a sentence, you either classify it under two label, which is positive or negative, or you could even have three labels, which is positive, neutral and negative. Okay, so let's see the techniques. Okay, so before that author has mentioned about certain rules that have to be kept in mind before trying out different transformations. So the first is the augmented data must follow the statistical distribution similar to that of original data set. Yeah, so this is pretty true because if you generate a totally new distribution by choosing different set of words and the meaning changes, the syntax changes, then the model will not be able to perform well. So the kind of transformations you'll have to learn has to be close to somewhat what original distribution is. So that model becomes robust in terms of generalizing to an overlapping distribution with a little difference. On the semantic level, the idea of finding transformation that will not affect the meaning of the data, but that will contribute to learning new forms in the sense of pattern recognition. So yeah, that's what we have already discussed. The transformation has to be semantically invariant. It should not change the original meaning of the data. Okay. A human should not be able to distinguish between the amplified data and the original data. So this is what they call as golden rule of plausibility. This is the reference for that. Let's move forward. Okay, so the first technique is called textual noise injection. So in this basically, you play around by changing or adding or deleting letters in a word. You change the casing of the word, you modify the punctuations. So these are a couple of things that authors propose as a part of textual noise injection. We hesitate to call noise injection a text augmentation because the addition of noise generally contributes more to the robustness of learning rather than recognizing new forms in the data. So yeah, this is pretty true because the addition of noise that we have just discussed around like playing with punctuations or casing usually make very minute syntactic changes at a word level. So the overall sentence structure is still preserved. So there is no new format that a model is essentially learning, which usually happens in the paraphrasing kind of a situation. Okay. Light textual noise injection is semantically invariant transformation. Strong textual noise injection is not a semantically invariant transformation. So light textual noise injection essentially means not applying multiple noise injections at the same time for the same word, because if that happens, the word might not be recognizable. It would have changed a lot. Instead, if you just apply one transformation, let's say, which can be seen as light textual noise, the chances are pretty high that semantically things won't vary much. Okay, so let's move forward. The second technique that the author introduced is spelling error injection, where the idea is to generate text containing common misspellings in order to train our models, which will thus become more robust to particular type of textual noise. Okay, so if you inject wrong spellings for any word at any position in a sentence, 
you are still playing around with that word and the sentence structure still remains intact so will the meaning that's why it's a semantically invariant transformation and also introducing misspellings will make you model robust by not giving too much weight to that word instead learning some generic features which will be useful during the test time so authors use a list of most common misspelling in english from oxford dictionaries so it's again a pretty deterministic approach the third technique that the authors introduce is about word replacement using thesaurus so here authors use wordnet which is nothing but a lexical database of words where the words are arranged in a hierarchical semantic relationship so for example if the node is animal then its child could be lion tiger and all the animals that you know of and the parent of animal could be living being so this way you have a hierarchical relationship that is stored and just for the information all of this is manually annotated so extending these database again is a big problem that's why these systems have retrieval issues in terms of unavailable information okay so lexical replacement consists of proposing one or more words that can replace a given word so you are essentially trying to find a substitute of a word that can be replaced for certain word in a given context which are mostly synonyms so in many situations we replace only adverbs and adjectives and sometime noun and rarely verbs so this is something like rule of thumb you play around with verbs and adjectives most of the times for finding their synonyms in the wordnet and you avoid verbs and nouns nouns simply because you will not find many in the wordnet and verbs because these are little typical to how do you replace them because they have a dependency between the subject and the object so changing a verb to its synonym could totally change the meaning of a sentence okay for lexical replacement one will favor the use of hypernyms and avoid the use of hypernyms okay so as i gave you the example right in this example animal is the hypernym of lion tiger and all of these things lion tiger all of these are co hypernyms and living being is the hypernym of animal and animal is the hypernym of living being so if you go too specific under certain category those are called hyponyms a more abstract general view of certain word is termed as hypernym i've made a particular video about this in a paper where they were using hypernym and hyponym extraction i'll provide the link for that in the i button make sure you check that out okay this is basically what they do for word replacement as they've said we usually prefer hypernyms because you would want to give your model more general and abstract features rather than drilling down to two specific features because if your model starts weighing those features really important then your model will suffer from a overfitting issue because then that feature would become too specific for that sentence so instead we make use of hypernyms and give more general features so that it could generalize better on unseen situations as well and avoid depending on particular words that could be specific distinct markers for few of the examples okay moving forward yeah so there is a challenge also that they mention the challenge is to choose the right sensor so if you play around with wordnet you will find multiple sensors to occur for a single word so authors tell about the strategy that they use so for a given word for which you are trying to find the lexical replacement you use the context of that word which means certain words to its left and right and then you look for all the sensors in the wordnet and extract their definitions and examples kind of concatenate them to make a bigger context then calculate a cosine similarity between the definition plus example sentence and the context that you have got from original text whichever has the highest match that is the relevant sensor for a target word so exactly that's what they have written so this is the strategy that they adopt okay the next technique that the author introduce is text augmentation by paraphrase generation okay so we have already talked about paraphrase generation while we were discussing the title but authors have also defined it so let's read that out paraphrase is an alternative surface form in the same language which expresses the same semantic content of the original form okay so yeah this is exactly the same thing where you apply a transformation to existing sentence while still retaining its semantic content this may occur in several levels you have lexical paraphrases phrasal paraphrases and sentential paraphrase so lexical paraphrase is nothing but when you replace a word by its synonym you call that lexical paraphrase so this is actually similar to the wordnet strategy that we looked earlier phrasal paraphrase is nothing but the extension of lexical paraphrase where you consider a phrase which is group of words and find its synonym so for example if you have a phrase take over then this could be replaced with assume control of in a sentence 
and similarly for sentential paraphrase you deal with the entire sentence so if the source sentence was i finished my work then its paraphrase could be i completed my assignment so here you can see new words have been introduced in the paraphrase yet the meaning of both the sentences is same okay so author has defined couple of ways to how you can do paraphrasing so one of the ways is using regular expressions so under this author majorly focuses on english language where a transformation of a verb or form into a contracted form and its inverse is semantically invariant transformation so they have this table over here so as you can see i am get reduced to this contracted form can't get reduced to this full form which is cannot so you have both forward and the backward mechanisms in this case as a transformation function so in a sentence you could either do a contraction of couple of words or you could even expand couple of short form to its longer versions but there is a catch in this transformations such as he is to his and he has to his is allowed even they introduce a ambiguous sentence but the inverse transformation of this to this and this to he has is forbidden because that totally changes the meaning so it looks like doing a contraction adds robustness to our model where it will understand both of these things mean more or less the same thing in a short format whereas if you do a inverse of that where you do a expansion the tense and the notion in which how it is used totally changes hence will the meaning that's why it's forbidden okay so the rule of thumb is if a transformation creates an ambiguity then it is often considered as semantically invariant because there are chances that the meaning could change okay so let's move forward another technique that the author introduced for paraphrase generation is using syntax tree transformations so in this technique author first creates a dependency tree of the input sentence where the nodes are nothing but the words in a sentence and edges are the syntactic dependencies between the words so let me give you an example so consider this was the input sentence a man eats an apple in the kitchen so once it goes through a dependency parser these are the arrows that you get as an output where you can basically find the dependencies between the verb and the nouns that you have in the terms of subjects and objects so with this if you think you can easily build basic question answering system such as if you ask the question man eats what the object is the answer for this which is apple you can also ask the question where does a man eat this lets you traverse a tree more deeper so you traverse from this node to the secondary object that is there which is kitchen so this is the answer so these days there are many open source libraries that do it for you out of the box so you need not worry about how to build a dependency parser in the first place so this is the full flow that the author has proposed you start with the input sentence you pass it through a parser authors over here have used syntax net it was state of the art dependency parser that was released by google a year or two ago i'm not sure if it's still state of the art or not but yeah authors have used this so you get a dependency tree the tree that we just saw now this goes to a black box which is called as dependency tree transformer that takes in this tree as an input and some transformation grammar so transformation grammar is manually written which creates a transform dependency tree which when you flatten it out you get a paraphrase sentence okay so yeah these are some of the examples to how the transformation rules can be written you can write a rule that can change a passive verb to active verb you can replace a noun or the nominal group by a pronoun this is usually coreference problem or you can think of removing an adjective or an adverb from a sentence so these are some of the rules but yeah this again totally depends on the author who is trying to build this system so this is a transformation diagram for active to passive voice as we can see the original sentence was in active voice which is a man eats an apple in the kitchen where the model has identified the word eats as the main verb for which the subject is a man and the object is an apple as a part of transformation it swaps both the position of object and subject so you can see an apple comes to first and a man was replaced at that position and the verb eats was expanded to give it a passive flow so now the sentence becomes an apple is eaten by a man in the kitchen so these are kind of transformations that one can do using syntax dependency tree okay so let's move forward the next technique that the author introduced for doing paraphrase generation is using back translation okay so in this the idea is to build two translation systems for example english to french let's say and from french to english so these pair of language could be anything depending on your source language in which you are currently working but make sure these translation systems if you use out of the box let's say from google api 
should have very low perplexity then only the paraphrases that you generate would be semantically invariant otherwise this technique would go for a toss so the idea is simple let's consider you have english sentence capital e you pass it through this black box that translates this english sentence to a french sentence let's call it capital f which again goes to another translation system that translates french sentence into english so now if both the translation systems were good e and e dash would be paraphrases and would be semantically invariant so this is the entire idea of back translation okay so let's move forward yeah so they have this full diagrammatic flow as well over here you have the original sentence you translate it to some target language you retranslate it to the original language so this is the back translated version that you have okay so in this author also introduces a quality check function that does some kind of a similarity matching between the original sentence and the paraphrase sentence that you generate so if things are totally identical there was no change in input and output or things are totally different based on certain threshold then you discard that paraphrase else you choose that as a paraphrase okay okay so now they have experiments and all so the task basically the author has chosen for evaluating the augmentation techniques is text polarity prediction which is nothing but sentiment analysis okay the data is imdb movie reviews so this is the pre processing pipeline for data augmentation you have the textual data you do a textual noise injection or spelling error correction you do a word replacement using thesaurus you do paraphrasing using all the three methods that we have discussed and finally you have the augmented set so yeah this is the results table if we do not use any of the augmentation technique which is this baseline then these are the numbers that we see with the standard deviations written over here the first experiment that the author does is by just injecting the textual noise so these are the accuracy numbers that we get so it is clearly evident that the numbers have significantly increased compared to the baseline where we do not add any augmentation technique and the standard deviation has reduced which means the model is more confident to handle unseen data set then these are the numbers across all the different augmentation techniques that the authors try and if we notice any of the rows the accuracy numbers are high compared to the baseline so now if we take a look at the last row which talks about using all the augmentation techniques then we can see across five algorithms these three give us the best result which kind of hints toward when you use all the augmentation techniques in parallel you are likely to get better results okay so let's move forward okay so in this diagram author has used the algorithm which is multi layer perceptron y axis is the accuracy and x is all the augmentation techniques so if we do not apply anything which is the baseline we get roughly something around 73% with a standard deviation of roughly plus 2 and minus 2 and now if we apply any of the techniques even in combination the average accuracy number is pretty high compared to what we get for the baseline so this is pretty encouraging result and similarly it happens for two layer multi layer perceptron for lstm even for bi lstm so yeah this is a good result so i guess now we are done with the paper so yeah it was a pretty extensive and interesting read how the author has put down many augmentation techniques in the nlp space also it was really interesting to see like how just a simple noise injection can give you so much boost in terms of text classification score so it would also be interesting to see how these techniques perform for different tasks such as named entity recognition and let's say regression problems but yeah having said that i really learned a lot today probably you guys as well so if you like such content make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel i'll meet you in the next one Bye